have a look at this text today as we begin chapter 2 of the letter to the Philippians. Quickly, let's recap what the Holy Spirit's been teaching us in these last four weeks through the Apostle Paul as he writes to the Philippians. Remember the first part of chapter 1, Paul is in prison. He's telling the Philippians not to give up, even though there are persecutions and problems in the church. And he reminds them that they are bond servants and a holy people. The implication is that you and I are bond servants and we're a holy people and not to give up. Then the next week we look, second part of chapter one. <clears throat> no matter what your circumstances, God can use them. And part of the journey of every Christian is to participate in Christ's sufferings. No matter what the motives of people are, we stay faithful and the gospel continues to be preached. And then when we got to the second part of that reading of chapter 1, verse 18b to 26, Paul was reminding us that with prayer and the Holy Spirit, all our circumstances would magnify God as long as Christ was our primary and singular passion. And then, of course, last week we heard that we were citizens of heaven. Even with the strugglings and the sufferings around us, Paul said we should stand firm in the Holy Spirit so that you can strive for the gospel and not be afraid of those who oppose you. So Paul wants us to live as citizens of heaven, to stand firm in the Holy Spirit so we can strive for the gospel and not be afraid of those who oppose us. Okay, so we're supposed to stand firm, not be afraid. How do you do that? That's what Paul is going to teach us this week. How do you survive the struggle and the suffering, especially of what's going ahead of them in Philippi? What about for us? How do we survive the struggle and the suffering? How do you live together in a community when we're all struggling and suffering? Well, title of my sermon today comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book. It's called Life Together. Here's my title, Life Together. See all these matches? These matches are uh, all in community and they are infectious. One match can inflame another match. And the flame of God, the flame of the Holy Spirit, can help a whole community ignite, if you like, and survive the suffering and the struggles. So Paul begins chapter 2 with this long, complex sentence with heaps of modifiers, verses 1 to 4. One sentence with all these modifiers. I'm going to show you some of the slides just to emphasize the modifiers, and you'll get the idea. So look, he starts off by saying, Therefore... If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if there's any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if there's any tenderness and compassion. Here's the big conditional clause. It's the if clause. It starts off with therefore. That means what was there before. The fact that you're citizens in heaven and you're standing firm in the Holy Spirit. You have to strive for the gospel and you don't be afraid of those who are going to oppose you. Because of that, here's the if. If you have any encouragement, here's the first slide, a tug of war, people tugging together on one side. And Paul's saying here, if you have any comfort from being united in Christ, you see the Philippians are together in struggle. They're struggling together as a church, just like these guys pulling on the rope are struggling together. If you have any comfort, if you've had any encouragement from being united in Christ, then I want you to remember that we're in this together. The unity of struggle brings great encouragement and comfort. And remember, Paul's saying to the Philippians, you're not alone. And what he's saying to us, you and me, we're not alone in this struggle either. Even though we can't see each other in person, we are together. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, not only if you have encouragement, but if you have 
any comfort from his love. Here's a picture of, of dad hugging his kids, the love of a family, children and their dad. Paul's saying, if you've got any comfort from Christ's love, the fact that we've all experienced God's love together, that you've been recipients of the agape love, I've been a recipient of agape love. Now, that's a love that can only come from God. That's not the world's love. Agape love is a, a love unique to Christians. It comes from God. If you've had any comfort from that love that he's given you, and then he goes on and he says, even if you had a common spirit, the Holy Spirit. Here's a picture of the Holy Spirit. Well, it's not a picture of the Holy Spirit. It's a picture of a flame that represents the Spirit. He's saying, if you have a common sharing of the Spirit, well, Paul and the Philippians, they have the Holy Spirit. You and I, we have the Holy Spirit. And he's the same Holy Spirit who loves us. He's the one who indwells us. So we have these things in common. We have encouragement from being united with Christ. We have comfort from his love. We have a common Holy Spirit. And finally, he says, look, if you have any tenderness and compassion, here's a picture of a ha uh, hands holding some, a, a pair of hands holding somebody else's hands in, in, a, in a sort of a slide of, of compassion. You know, Jesus has changed us. He's made us more tender and more compassionate. You've become more whole because of Jesus. We've become more caring for each other. So here's this really interesting formula that Paul is using. If you have encouragement from being together, if you've been comforted by Christ's love together, if you've shared the Holy Spirit together, and if you have tenderness and compassion together, which is what we have, then, says Paul, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love in the one spirit and the one mind. Make my joy complete. This is really important, church. Listen to this, says Paul. This will make me really happy. This will really please me. This is what I want for you if you do these things. Now, remember, we have shared some common things, not what the world shares. We've shared things from the kingdom. We've been encouraged together. We've loved together. We've had the Holy Spirit together. We have tenderness and compassion together. Because of those things, then be like-minded, says Paul. If you want to have unity in the church, you need to have people who are like-minded. You don't want people who think the same. You want people who are like-minded. Here's a picture and a slide of a neon head. It's, it's just a symbol to say that when we think, we want to think together um, on the basis of the things that are really important to us. Literally in the Greek, the Greek says, set your minds on the same things, if you like, have the same mindset of the Lord. Now, as I said, it doesn't mean you think the same. It means that you have the same commitment to Jesus in the areas of life and values and people. We all think differently. But Paul says, if we've experienced this before, then to bring unity, be like-minded. Be people who... Set your minds on the same things. Set your minds on the kingdom. He says, have the same love. Well, what love is he talking about? Obviously, in the Greek, it's the word agape. Have the same love. Here's a picture of Jesus on the cross. There's lots of different types of love. But you and I have the love that comes from Jesus. The love that God lavished on his son. And his son lavished on us. We should be united in the way we think and in the united in the way we love, using godly love. One pastor said, true godly love begins when someone else's needs are more important than your own. So if we have all these things in common, then we should strive to be like-minded, to have the same love 
And Paul says in verse 2 here, being one in spirit and of mind. One of spirit and in mind. Literally, together in soul. Here's a picture of a heart and a brain holding hands. Okay, heart and brain holding hands. They are linked together, linking the soul and the heart and the mind together. Feeling and thinking. Don't just have the same mindset about the way you think, but have the mindset of the way you live, your whole life, your whole being. Paul is accenting the unity of the community. You see, he's trying to say that when you go through these struggles, you have all these things in common, and if you have them in common, then what you should be doing is having the same mindset the same love and the same spirit as you, mind and spirit as you live out your life. If you have those things, you will have unity. It's funny, all the different formulas you hear for, for unity, but I want to suggest to you that this is what Paul is telling us. He's advising the Philippians, in the future, when things get really tough, you stick to this. And you'll find you'll have unity. And we'll find out later on that there is some uh, tension in Philippi between a couple of people that is threatening unity. We'll come to that later on. So when we get to verse 3, Paul says, Look, I want you to have um, this like-mindedness, this love, this together in the soul. But be aware that there are some things that are going to challenge that. Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. Here's the first thing. Watch out, says Paul, for selfish ambition. Here's a picture of a magnifying glass on a page. And what's the middle, what's the whole Word centered being magnified, me. Watch out for me. Paul is saying that selfish ambition is the very heart of the fallen human nature. Self interest, self aggrandizement, making yourself look better than you actually are, especially at the expense of the others. When our children were young, I used to say to them, What was the middle letter of the word sin? S I N I. Paul is trying to say that when you live a life of selfish ambition, selfishness, that will threaten the unity of a community. The second thing he says is do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Here's a picture of a golden egg walking on top of the heads of other eggs. And this egg is sort of the golden egg trampling on everybody else. Vain conceit. Literally the words empty glory. The type of glory, this is one of the comments that Gordon Fee made, the type of glory that only the self-blessed bestow on themselves. They believe their own advertising They think way too much of themselves, think too highly of themselves. So the things that are going to threaten community and unity in that community are selfish ambition and vain conceit. When people start being self-centered, not thinking about others, but thinking about themselves can be very subtle, but it becomes obvious. And he said, don't do that. Rather, verse 3, In humility, value others above yourselves. In other words, be humble. Here's a picture of a runner helping another runner finish the race. The runner that's helping has conceded the race in order to help the other runner finish. What a sign of humility that is. Value others above yourselves. Actually, humility is a Christian virtue. In the Greco-Roman world, uh, humility was considered a shortcoming. It wasn't something that they 
um, you know, looked for. But in the Christian communities, humility, humility was something that we strive for. Now, of course, there is a false humility when people become self-centered. But true humility is a byproduct when you value others more than yourself. And the byproduct of that is humility. You can't actually go out to get humility. It's a byproduct of considering others above yourselves. And, and Paul says, you should have the same love as um, the, the love that God had for Jesus and that Jesus has for us. We should have that same love and care for people. So look, Make sure that you're not looking out for your own interests. This is verse 4. Not looking out um, for yourself. You're not out to surpass yourself. You're looking for the needs of others. So Paul is saying that if you have any encouragement, any love, any spirit of sharing, any compassion, all these things that we have in unity, then to please him, to make his you know, joy complete, we should be like-minded. We should share in God's love and we should be together in soul and spirit and, and in the way we live. Watch out for selfishness, for conceit and be humble. And in the end, if you can do those things, you'll have unity in your community. And, you know, for us, that's a really, really important lesson. We're going through social isolation. We're in the process of trying to buy a church. Things are really difficult. And some of us are struggling. And maybe some are even are suffering. Just like the church in Philippi. Paul's saying, we've got all these things in common. Spiritual things. We're united with Christ. We have this love. We have this spirit. We have compassion. Therefore, we should be like-minded. Love God. Love together and be together in spirit and soul. So, church, I pray that you'll pay attention to these words and that the Holy Spirit will inspire you to live a life of the kingdom and for the kingdom. And as a result, we'll see unity in our community. Make sure that you don't live your life based on what you want. Keep your eyes open to serve others and be humble. And in the end, here's my last slide, in the end, you can make a difference. Here's a community of people holding hands as they walk into the future, sharing the love of God, if you like. That's like our community, all these different people sharing God's love, you can make a difference. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for these words of Paul and we pray that your Holy Spirit will keep us unified as a church body and as a family. Help us to be like-minded, to love like you have loved us and to be together in soul and spirit. Watch over us for that human quality of selfishness and conceit and help us to be truly humble. We thank you for the things that we share uh, in the kingdom, the un being united with you, the comfort we have of your love, the Holy Spirit we share together, the tenderness and compassion we have. And as we look at these things, we pray, Father God, that you would bless us as we go forward in Jesus' name. Amen.